Howdy. We're going to be documenting our trip through New Zealand, uh, Australia. Where are we going exactly? Are we going to New Zealand and Australia? Is that right? <laughs> Auckland, Sydney, Melbourne. We also want to see a kangaroo. The, the Maybe a koala. Yeah, right. The entire the sheep. sheep? There's a lot of sheep in New Zealand. Uh, anyway, we're at SFO. We're about to check in. We're going to hop this flight to Auckland. So the next footage you'll see is either going to be some B-roll laid over tropical house music or Tom sleeping. <laughs> Prebeat. Prebeat. Have you ever done this before? And hello. Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you know what? We'll, st we'll start this. Alright, so look. We're in Auckland. We made it. Uh, Tom and I slept a lot on the plane. When I said slept a lot, I think, you know, we were doing high intensity interval sleeping. You would do sleep for two minutes on, wake for five to seven minutes. The plane was shaking pretty badly. I actually don't think it would have mattered if we were in first class or not, because we're just shaking. Anyway, uh, so we get to our Airbnb here, which is, uh, it's actually a nice location. It's right downtown Auckland. Um, we're missing some lights in this chandelier and a second bedroom. <laughs> Apparently one and a half bedrooms instead of two bedrooms. I think I have to show you. So this kitchen's built, right? All right, so the kitchen, you know, I could do an Instagram live in here. And so you go in, you're like, whoa, cool. Sorry for my stuff. This is a sweet room. Where's the second one? <laughs> and then, so we're going to force Tom to sleep there. You know, so it's not all peaches and roses here with the, uh, <laughs> with the Barbell Medicine crew. We're going to... We can blame Tom. No, no, we'll blame the internet. It's always the internet's fault. All right. It's for YouTube, doing Instagram Live. Hey, what's up everybody? It's Jordan, underscore Barbell Medicine. Uh, we're coming to you live from New Zealand. Uh, so we're gonna do a Q&A. Can you elaborate on your thoughts on Steph Cohen, St oh, Steph Cohen's birth control post? Sure, so, you know, I, I'm trying to turn over New Leaf 2018, just not be super salty and like, you know, talk much trash on people. So, Let's see how we do this here. So Steph Cohen is not has no pharmacology training. She's a physical therapy student. Um, so just it seems a little odd that one would give you know pharmaceutical advice to humans with that lack of background and but also being in the healthcare field and having knowledge of like bad things that can happen to you lawsuit wise potentially uh, or or uh, you know bad outcome wise by inappropriately advising folks. And she quotes some stuff that Lyle McDonald apparently has recently published in his book on this subject, uh, suggesting that birth control decreases testosterone levels by X amount of percentage, which certainly may happen. Uh, even non-hormonal birth controls uh, can actually affect hormonal, hormonal levels. And she cites this as the reason is why she was not as strong as she previously was uh, because of the loss of testosterone and because of this anabolic uh, uh, aldosterone receptor. So, okay, so that this is a hypothesis, right? That testosterone levels are decreased when you take any sort of hormonal birth, hormonal birth control. It's not necessarily true. Uh, and that that's important and causes functional outcomes that are undesired, like strength loss, hypertrophy loss, training effect uh, being decreased or attenuated. Um, and so you actually go look at the data and the data doesn't support this. The data has tested D1 athletes that are females, has tested high level professional athletes on birth control, and they have no difference you know, on strength outcomes, placebo versus birth control, no difference with muscle cross-sectional area. The testosterone level has been shown not to really matter for males or females, provided it's within normal range. 
Uh, although high level females in general, elite level female athletes will have a higher uh, resting or uh, uh, testosterone level than their non-competitive cohorts, but that's m merely an observational finding, not necessarily like, oh, if you have low testosterone, you're going to be a bad competitor. So I think the whole post is shenanigans. Um, I certainly can appreciate and empathize with folks who do have side effects to birth controls. And I think that they should work together with their either primary care physician or their OB or whoever's prescribing this medication, not their physical therapy student that they have near them. Uh, they should work with whatever professional is actually going to prescribe this medication if desired for whatever, for either uh, birth control or treating another issue. Um, they should work with them on finding whatever would, one fits their goals of care and their lifestyle and other things best. So on average, birth control, people, they don't gain weight. They don't weigh more. They don't have more body fat. They're not weaker. Um, and again, this has even been studied in athletic populations. Um, there are some birth controls that cause weight gain, like Depo, the shot, uh, for instance. And there's some evidence that uh, uh, there are hormonal changes that can cause certain side effects in some people, and a lot of that is based on previous expectation, placebo, or even nocebo, rather, would be more appropriate in this case. So well, I think overall what Steffi did was just a big nocebo. It's more harm than good, and I think that people need to think very critically about where they're getting their advice from. And uh, I mean, she blocked me a long time ago because she posted something from the Starting Strength book, and I told her that she needed to cite the attribute, her attribution. She needed to make sure, give credit um, it was a deadlift picture, and then she blocked me. It's fine. Uh, I, I'm okay with that. I just think it's. It was really interesting to see that she gave all this advice on birth control, and that people in general are like, "Oh, birth control does all these bad things," and you ask them to cite their sources, and they don't. They say stuff like, "Oh, there's been no studies on birth control long term." It's like, sure there have. You just haven't looked, because you're not in this field, right? So anyway, those are my thoughts. A little long-winded. If birth control drops testosterone by 50%, I'm never using condoms again. I don't... Oh, I see. Like, condoms would be the birth control. I see. 83% effective with typical use. You gotta learn how to use them. Do you think the birth control comments are politically motivated? I think that's a stretch. I think the birth control comments are people who need to spend more time discuss it with their clinician. And I don't think it's their fault, I think it's the clinician's fault. But I don't think it's really their fault because they don't have enough time to sit and talk with their patients about what's going on and what our goals of care are and everything else. It's not enough time. So maybe in that instance it's politically motivated. <laughs> so now I, I know. I thought it was like 408 felt like a 10. And then I put them on the right side for the next attempt. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's a three principle. Like, for instance, there are many templates you could make that would have two lifts, two primary lifts. The, the issue is this, is stress, right? So after the, at the completion of starting strength novice linear progression, which is marked by the failure of the starting strength novice linear progression to produce an increase with the, within the time interval allowed, right? It's 48 hours. At that point that it no longer happens, you are saying, I do not respond to that training with a commensurate increase in my performance, which means you need more stress. That is the base, that's like the fundamental principle. So the thought, for instance, that you don't have enough recovery to, to deal with the stress is, I think, a fundamental error as well, because that, that shapes how you perceive and therefore manage the problem. If you thought it was a recovery problem, for instance, you just wouldn't train for the next week, right? You would train less and still 
progress. In fact, you would, and then if that, again, was the, if that was your fundamental truth, you would train less and less and less and less until you wouldn't train at all, and then you would somehow still get stronger, right? So again, that is a fundamental error, I think, that is made or is un misunderstood, perhaps. So, so once you have said, I'm no longer responding to the starting strength novice in your progression, and there are no reasons by which I am self-sabotaging myself, i.e. three minute rest periods, i.e. I'm losing massive amounts of weight, i.e. I have some disease process that is otherwise compromising my ability to respond to training. Which, you know, Maybe. May, perhaps. Uh, so for viewers at home, not to break HIPAA, even though we're not in this country, uh, or in the United States, uh, this particular person does have a, an issue where he's taking a medication that would compromise his ability to respond to training. In any event, the baseline principle is the same. Stress has to increase. Now, if you are in a time crunch situation where you don't have enough time to train on a given day to get three lifts in three times per week, I would train more times per week. I would train four times per week and try to do that and get the same amount of weekly volume. It's the same amount of weekly stress is ideally what you're trying to do, particularly as an intermediate because now your stress recovery adaptation cycle is longer, right? You have to accumulate stress over a longer period of time. Arbitrarily, we call this a week, right? And then you recover. Uh, within that week as well, and then adapt. You can showcase that you've adapted the next week. That's what I would do. So I would take your standard three lift per day, three day a week template, and turn it into four days a week, however many you know, things can, you get. Can you train four days a week? Or yeah, it's not the uh, amount of days I can, it's the, the time for each yeah. one. Yep. But then I guess the problem I, without thinking about too much is if the uh, lifts would back up. It's fine. It's fine. Well, yeah, because again, you're not necessarily looking for day-to-day -day performance increases because now you're, you are saying, I am an intermediate. Yeah. You're looking for week-to-week -week, uh, performance increases as an early intermediate, and as a later intermediate, it might be two-week-to-two-week -two performance increases. So in reality, the weight on the bar matters little. The stress, the overall stress matters more. Now, yeah, we'd like to see the weight on the bar go up each time, but... It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the most important thing. The most important thing is getting the correct amount of stress. So if, for instance, you go up from the previous week, right, in weight, and you're like, hell yeah, I just PR'd, but it was the wrong amount of stress that within the entire context of the program subsequently does not lead to a performance improvement, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. So. Um, yeah, my recommendation would be that you would train more days per week and get the total amount of weekly stress in. If, if, if it wasn't possible to train more, right, then at that point I would try to figure out some time uh, efficient process to get a bunch of, to generate a lot of stress. So things we use are myo reps, uh, uh, time sets, so where you have 10 minutes, for instance, to use a 12 rep max sort of load on a lift and you do as many reps as possible without ever going to failure. You're just jamming a bunch of stress in in a short period of time. Now that's not optimal and even if you didn't have enough time to do that, then you'd say, do you have enough time to train to get better? Because that at some point you'll run up against that, right? Again, the, if the underlying fundamental reason why you stop getting stronger on novice linear progression is that you cannot generate enough stress to drive an adaptation, at some point you're training four days a week or five days a week with three lifts per day and a ton of reps and whatever, and you're not getting any better, guess you're going, you're going to need more. And that's not ac accessible for everybody, right? So there's a reason why the highest level athletes, particularly in the barbell sports, train very, very frequently. They have, have to. It's not by choice. They don't want to squat 16 times a week if they're an Olympic lifter. They have to to get better. Um, but anyway, so that's what I would do in your situation. And I don't mean to over talk Tom, I just want to make sure that the fundamental is understood that the reason the starting strength novice linear progression, the reason the starting strength novice linear progression stops working is because it's not enough stress. It's not your recovery. It can't be because again, you would stop training and get better. I mean, that, that I don't understand. I don't see another understand, uh, way to understand that. I think that you are largely correct. All Absolutely. right. All right. Uh, Hype me up. Because I mean, three sets of three sets of five will stop working, yep. uh, and eventually, what you're you do need a larger stressor, but you have you're essentially working at such a high intensity level that you cannot essentially accumulate enough work. Um, right, unless you. So what you could do is decrease the reps that you do. Instead of three sets of five, you do three sets of three, and the weight on the bar will go up for a few weeks. But it's not because you've gotten any stronger. Is because you are reducing the total amount of stress 
and you're able to display a strength that you've previously built. We call this peaking. And let's say that works for about two or three weeks, which is generally how long you could hope to milk that out on an actual novice that doesn't have other stuff going on. Uh, at the end of the three weeks where you finally say, I am no longer responding to this type of stress, you have now detrained the novice because they're dealing with less overall work throughout the week, right? You have beaten them up sufficiently, all right? And for what? For an extra 15 pounds on a squat that in six months you would not know the, di I mean, the difference, if anything, you've put them back because they're now training on a higher volume, high, uh, a more intermediate program, you've set them back on their ability to tolerate that sort of training. So for their long-term development, you, you may have compromised that. This is, again, a fundamental sort of thing. Peaking for a novice is silly. If you're going to a meet and the meet means something, sure. But if you're not going to a meet, why would you, why would you peak? It doesn't make sense to me, right? Like, and a, another potential thing you could do is higher set of five and then still keep volume the same, but you, you back it off a little. There's still elements of peaking yeah, in that. Yeah, because uh, you're reducing the total stress. I don't, know that it's, I don't know that it's a strict either or. You're probably still getting a little stronger, but to your point, you're probably getting less acclimated to volume and that may require a deload and some, some backing up. So like a lot, of the, a lot of the things you can do, there's ways of smoothly transitioning from novice to intermediate. Uh, yeah. And then there's ways that are less smooth and, you know. Yep. My, my fear would be to significantly drop volume in that situation because you would be, your work capacity would go down. You're not actually getting any stronger. You're just demonstrating previously developed strength, which is, again, a, a, this is a fundamental principle of programming. Uh, changing the goalposts mid-program, uh, like 5-3-1 does. Okay, so five, three, one, you do fives for a week, then threes for a week, then ones for a week. And it's like, well, the weight went up, I got stronger. It's like, well, no, you just changed the test. The test was fives, then it was threes, and then it was ones. Are you strong? If your set of one is 20 pounds stronger than your set of five, did you get any stronger? I, I don't know. Because week one, you may have been able to do that, right? I know that there are a certain amount of skills that you have to use to display a true one rep max, right? You have to get exposed to doing singles so you get efficient at doing them. And there's certainly a psychological component of handling heavy weights that you have to like get over and develop. But what I'm getting is the raw strength to actually complete that task, squatting 620 pounds for one, may have been there 12 weeks prior, which suggests that all the training in the middle, all that was, was a transference exercise. You're trying to transfer the strength that somebody already had to a 1RM because you have not developed any more strength within that period of time. Uh, so I think it's very important when assessing programming that you're not changing the goalposts all the time, you're not uh, you know, peaking unnecessarily so, and that long-term development is sort of the guiding principle. And long-term development requires an increase in stress. There's, there's, no, there's, there's no way around it.